I'd like to introduce James Cameron. James is the president and CEO of Security Concepts Group. He's going to be speaking on assailant workplace violence management training. So without further ado, James, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming in. 11 o'clock, first, uh, one of the first briefings today, so I appreciate your attention today. We plan on talking about right now is active assailant and, work and workplace violence management training. So we're not going to run into the uh, run, hide, fight discussion. This is more as managers, what do we need to think about within our organization? Quick introduction about myself. The main thing that I, I want you to take away from this is I have been a first responder to five different mass casualty situations, not in a military capacity. Yes, I'm a combat veteran, but this was while I was working with the United States State Department. Uh, two hotel attacks, a press room attack, a dining facility attack, and then a police graduation attack, uh, that most recent one being 2015 in Chad. That's what I bring to this discussion and this topic. First thing we really need to do is get our mindset correct, is that we need to recognize that there is the potential for workplace violence, active assailants, and other emergency type situations. Do we all agree on that? Can it happen anywhere? Of course it can, right? So it doesn't matter how much training you want to provide within your organization, if you can't get people's mindset to change, that the probability and possibility is there, that training will go in one ear and we'll ride out the other. Agreed? Right? I don't generally like to focus on some of these reports, but I thought for this situation it would be helpful. Uh, right now, what I'm referencing is the US Secret Service a report that was issued March 2018 for mass attacks in public spaces. I'm not going to go into all the detail on all the information that's provided in that report because we all know if one incident happens, it's one incident too many, correct? But I think it's the most current versus the FBI one that they have one that's from 2000, 2013, and there's a lot of lessons learned that's not included in that. Another takeaway when we take a look at these reports as managers is understanding that definitions change from three-letter agency to another. So what the Secret Service considers an incident may not be the same type of incident for DHS or for the FBI. Prime example, I was in an active shooter training from DHS and they didn't consider San Bernardino as an active shooter incident. They consider that workplace violence. So when they compile their numbers, that account doesn't, that, that, that incident doesn't account in their numbers. So again, when we take a look at these reports, just something to be uh, cognizant of and keep in the back of your mind. Now this study was on 28 incidents from January to December of 2017. They don't really go into detail what those incidents were as far as why those selected incidents. It's just that they selected those incidents. And the, the report is based on incidents that had three or more casualties. Total loss of life, in this report was 147, nearly 700 were injured. Nearly half were motivated by personal grievance, and we'll talk about that, and all had at least one significant stressor within the last five years. Why is that important? Is it important for us to be able to identify when somebody is having an individual stressor in their life? Has anybody heard of the pathway to violence, documented pathway that every mass murderer goes through? If we get away from that cliche of see something, say something, and actually educate our people, what are they looking for? Describe that pathway to violence and describe those steps. Can we help mitigate that? Yeah, possibly, because then now we can identify those significant stressors. Half had financial instability, and over three quarters made concerning communications. Again, that's on the pathway to violence. So they start with the ideology in their head, and then they start uh, on social media, writing th threats down, making comments, making it known. Uh, these are, these uh, attacks happen in public sites. 42% happen in businesses, 29% open spaces. Again, open spaces, a little bit more inter into interpretation. Does a parking lot of a business constitute an open space or is that a business, right? They don't really go into detail too much on that. 13% uh, happens in schools which is a fairly low number considering that's all we hear about, right? We hear about the ideological attacks in public spaces, but what do we mainly hear? Schools, correct? Not that we shouldn't hear about schools, but that number is fairly low in the grand scheme of this report. 10% happen in trains and airports, 6% in churches. Now weapons, 82% are firearms. 
they don't distinguish long gun, shotgun, pistol, it's just a weapon. 11% are vehicles, 7% are knives. But again, do they differentiate? And what about those ones that combine weapon systems? So if they use a vehicle and then jump out and start hacking people up with a knife like they did in Ohio, is that one instance or is that a combination of instances? So again, keep that in mind. Duration, 50% happen, uh, take less than five minutes, 21% five to 14 minutes, and 29% 15 minutes or longer. Pulse nightclub, that took three hours, right? Components to, to motivation, again, these grievances, a total of 46% had a grievance, whether it was workplace, domestic, or personal. Ideological had 21%, political 4%. I believe that's the one that they're referencing as far as the uh, Republican um, Senator Scalise that was shot, so that was a politically motivated. Uh, fame and unknown, and I still believe that Paddock is still considered in that unknown. Paddock was the shooter here in Las Vegas. So now we've got a little bit of background. We understand that these situations are horrible and they're, they're terrible, they shouldn't happen. But we also need to, as managers, we, under, we need to understand what business impact does that have on us. Aside from loss of life and injuries, right? We all know that that's terrible and we know that's gonna have an impact. But what about the legal liability and exposure? How are you protecting your organization against these threats? Because if you're not protecting against these threats, now you're opening yourself up and opening that organization up. How does, it, how does an event affect morale and performance of your current employees? If you have an active shooter or active assailant attack at your workplace, how does it affect those everyday employees that may or may not have been included? How you respond to that incident will also affect their performance and their morale, right? If they don't feel like the company's taking care of them, why should I take care of the company? Business continuity, how is it how can you help your organization get back up and running as quick as possible producing those products or services? How much downtime are you going to have? What is that business continuity plan? Have you cited, have you looked at other locations where you can potentially open up and work in the, in the interim? Because we have to understand, and we'll talk about this in a, in a few slides ahead, we have to understand that once an incident happens, what takes place? The site gets locked down, right? It's a crime scene. So depending on how long that agents, that police agency has it, you're not conducting any work there. And then what happens? Then you have to have site cleanup, site repair, right? So that's gonna take additional time. This is all taken away from your bottom line of making money, which is ultimately what the business is there to do. Recruiting and retention. If you don't respond well to an active shooter or you don't help prevent or mitigate an active shooter or workplace violence, how is that gonna hurt retention and recruitment for that organization? I don't want to work for a company that's, that's kind of open and I feel that I'm not safe there. If I don't want to work there, other people won't as well. And then lastly, damage to brand and image. There's been several companies that have had workplace violence that have had to close their doors because their brand and image has been uh, terribly tarnished, right? When you think of Virginia Tech, do you think of a great university or do you think active shooter? Right? How is that associated? When you think Mandalay Bay, do you think uh, they have great hotel rooms or do you think, oh, active shooter? Right? There's a stigma that's, that's going to be attached to your brand and that image. I did want to start out with saying we need to change the dialogue from active shooter to active assailant. Active shooter really pinholes to one type of weapon system and one kind of uh, ideology or thought process. So I believe now most of us have started using the term active assailant, is that correct? Active assailant is still active shooter. Active assailant, right? So what does an assailant mean? It means a person or a group of persons actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill or cause serious bodily injury to a person or groups of persons. It could be with an AR style weapon, could be with a pistol, could be with a knife, pressure cooker, or a rental van. Right? So we can't just talk about active shooter. We have to now broaden that scope and say it's an active assailant. And now once you broaden that scope, when you take a look at your, your facilities, maybe now that opens up some gaps and vulnerabilities. Because you were planning for an active shooter, but you weren't planning on stopping a packing truck from running people over in their break area. Well, maybe now we need to take a look at that, right? So remember, the reason why, or the how and why are, are, are irrelevant to your survival against active assailants. And they're gonna do whatever it takes to accomplish their mission. I'm gonna read this because this is actually OSHA's definition, which we should all be well aware of what OSHA says as far as workplace violence. 
Any act or, or threat of physical violence, harassment, intimidation, or other threatening disruptive behavior that occurs at the work site. It goes on to say, it ranges from threats and verbal abuse to physical assaults and even homicide. It can affect and involve employees, clients, customers, and visitors. Why is that important for us to know? Well, that's a liability issue, and we also need to know, are we covering, are we protecting our employees? Are we, are we protecting our customers, our visitors? <clears throat> Along with OSHA stating four types of workplace violence, there's actually a fifth now. So originally there was type one, which was criminal intent. That's your basic robbery, uh, burglary, things like that. Somebody's coming into your location uh, to steal from you, basically. You have customer and client. I have call centers that are repossession call centers or, the, or debt collectors. Do they have angry people on the other end of that phone? Absolutely. So that would be more of a customer to client type of workplace violence. You have worker on worker. My supervisor wrote me up, I'm gonna take it out on him or her, right? You have domestic violence. That's where there's, a, whether it's a domestic partner within the organization, that could be worker on worker, or a domestic partner outside the organization that is gonna come in and take their revenge out on their ex, male, female, or on their new partner, whatever the case may be, they're coming to take revenge. And that fifth is now that ideological violence. Right, those are ideologically driven, whether it's left, right, center, whatever the case may be, whatever's driving them ideologically, uh, that's their motivation. Now understanding these five types of workplace violence will better prepare you to prepare your organization and close those gaps of vulnerability. If we, if we only plan to handle type one criminal intent, we are leaving ourselves and our organization vulnerable to all other types. Now is there crossover? Absolutely but it's important that we know individual types so that way we can help mitigate those. We're gonna talk a little bit about legal considerations that we need to take as, man as uh, security managers or organizational management. General, and it starts with the general duty clause of OSHA. I'm sure everybody's heard of this, right? Each employer shall furnish to each his and her employees employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to his or her employees. Now recent court cases, which I have a bunch of them, now stipulate that these workplace violence situations are recognizable hazards, right? If you've got complaints against employees and you as an organization or as a security manager do nothing to help mitigate that, are you responsible? Yes. Are you violating the general duty clause, uh, 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 general duty clause of care? Yes, right? So we need to be aware of that. We also have the American National Standard. Anybody seen this? Do I have one? All right, just so you guys are aware, I'm also on the committee that's helping revise this, and this will be put back out in about a year. Sir? Not that you have to answer right now, but later on, could you talk about, excuse me, what those minimum standards would be, in your opinion? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some court cases, actually. Thank you. So in the American National Standard, and as we know, ASIS is only guidance, right? Uh, but legal teams have used this guidance as a measuring stick in a court of law. So in the back, in the summary of the American National Standard put out by ASIS, it states, no organization, large or small, public or private, for-profit or non-profit sector can assume that will be immune from the wide range of disturbing, threatening, and violent conduct that falls within the broad definition of workplace violence. It goes on to say, all organizations ultimately carry the responsibility both for humanitarian, obviously we want to say life, right? And legal reasons to protect employees and others who interact with the workplace to the fullest practical extent. Right? This can be used against an organization in a court of law for uh, damages that come from workplace violence or active assailant. Agreed? <clears throat> These are just some of the topics that organizations and, and frankly individuals can be exposed to legally. So we already talked about OSHA, uh, negligence, which often in most cases they charge straight away with gross negligence and maybe plea it down to negligence, right? Uh, respondent superior, uh, wrongful death, loss of parental consortium. Does anybody know what that is? Okay, so what this means is if I'm a father of three and I get killed at work, 
My children can sue because I am no longer there to provide them the love, the affection, the interaction that they need to develop as human beings. Any, did anybody know about that? One person? Okay. So again, something to think about. These are all, these all expose a company and organization. Premise liability, basically meaning if you own the property that the event occurs on, you could be held liable. Voluntary assumption of duty to protect. How many companies here, or how many uh, organizations here hire security guards? Well, you just volunteered to assume uh, duty to protect, right? Okay, and we're gonna talk about security guards in a second. Pain and suffering and emotional suffering. Those are kind of no-brainers. So talk about some damages that are awarded. Now keep in mind, most of the active shooter workplace violence scenarios that we've seen in the news lately, they're still going through the court process. These are the ones that are out of the court process, they're settled, they're case law, and they've gone through appeals, all of it's settled. So this uh, munch bar, one killed, one wounded, the estate was ordered $3.7 uh, $3 million. The issue here, the bar manager told an employee and a customer that had a grievance, take it outside. Don't do this in the bar. That's all they did, but did they prevent anything? No. Did he have training on de-escalation? No. Was it a bar? Was there alcohol? Do people get out of hand? Yes. Should he have de-escalation training? Yes. That's what the courts ruled. Uh, the other injured, which was the, the uh, deceased sister, was awarded half a million dollars. Virginia Tech, we all know about that one, killed 31, wounded 23. Those were, that, that court settled for $11 million. Navy, shoot, uh, Navy Yard, 12 killed, eight wounded, $25 million. Newtown, 27 killed, two wounded, 1.5 million, with another 11 million still pending in the courts. Kraft Foods, now I threw this one in. This one was three killed, one wounded, $40 million award. What, in, in this case, they had, uh, Kraft Foods had outsourced to a security company to provide security protection uh, and site security. They were found negligent because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. There was an employee that was being suspended for, I believe it said a ruckus, causing a ruckus at work. So she was being suspended. Security was to escort her off property. That security escorted her out to the main gate, not off property, let her go to her car. She then retrieved a weapon, came back in, the gate guard let her in, and she proceeded to go to the break room and kill three people and wound another. The security company was found at fault for that. Uh, the Fort Hood, workplace violence, terrorism, however you want to categorize it, 14 were killed, 33 wounded, and that cost $25 million. All right, these are big judgments. Uh, I believe that uh, that Munch Bar went out of business because of it. That was well beyond their liability coverages. Um, and real quick, what will also be posted in the app is I have a legal white paper on legal liabilities based off of uh, crime or uh, judgments, current judgments to include the ones I just mentioned and a few others, and they actually go over in detail what the responsibilities are. Um, the numbers that they use in here are based off the FBI report from 2000 to 2013, so it's a little dated, but the court law is still relevant. So let's talk about security guards. I own a security company, I love this conversation, right? So as an organization, there's an expectation that those security guards will provide a safe environment, correct? That's what they're there to do. However, the policy says observe and report only. Does that contradict what the expectation is? Absolutely. So as security professionals in here, how are we addressing that? Are you addressing it? Should you address it? What if physical response is necessary? If they do nothing, there's lawsuits. If they overextend themselves, there's lawsuits, right? So we have to find that middle ground, and that middle ground starts with a lot of training and a lot of policies and procedures that back up what those guards are allowed to do. Uh, there's a quote down here. I put unknown because it's not mine. I just can't remember where I found it. Instead of, instead, of, instead of hoping for the best, a better position is to assume the worst and train and equip your security force for the worst case scenario. Is that true? 
Yeah. How many times do we security that are just uh, filling a position? I need X number of bodies for X number of hours, X number of days. Here's a company shirt. Go stand over there. Right? <clears throat> I've listed some security guard audit questions. If you have security, if you outsource security, uh, or if you, it's your in-house security, do your guards have specific site post orders? I'm going to guess probably uh, very limited, unless they're full-time employees for a specific organization. But I don't think there's the, you know, like I said, people, I, I see it all, all the time on Facebook, need five guards tomorrow. Really? Are they getting, are they getting trained up for that site specific? Probably not. Do the guards just do uh, observe and report? As an outsourced company, I bet the C-suite of that organization doesn't realize most of those guards are observe and report only. Am I wrong? No, because they have that understanding that, hey, this security guard is going to keep us safe. Right? Talked about it already. During an active assailant event, what is the role of the security guard? Are they to intervene? Has that been explained to them? What if they only have less than lethal? Should they respond? I say, yeah, absolutely. Right? Is a security guard if the security guard is armed, does their role change? Do they engage the attacker? And if they do, at what range? And how qualified are they to do that? Has that been explained to them? Or again, even as armed, are they sit there for observe and report? Yes, sir. So th that really depends state to state because here in Nevada, for example, the misnomer is I use an off-duty police officer, that's, that's an end-all be-all. But they still have a requirement to have a guard card. They still have a requirement to have an armed guard card if they're armed. And all their protections that they have as an off-duty police officer may or may not apply because they're working in a private capacity. So there is that misnomer of, oh, I've got, I've got that, was that the HR 214 or uh, whatever the, I wasn't a police officer, so whatever that, whatever that certificate is, I can carry so I can come work. Well, that's not true. We're now, as, as security managers, we're now opening up our organization to further liability if there is a situation, because now we've used an unlicensed off-duty police officer. And some agencies don't even allow that. Right? So here in Nevada, because of corruption, you have to have prior approval from the state licensing board to use off-duty police officers. And it doesn't matter if they're Metro or if they're LAPD, New York PD. If they come here and they want to work, that organization who's sponsoring them has to have prior approval from the state by name. Sir. Sorry, what I was specifically referencing is um, trying to educate the people that just because you have an off-duty police officer doesn't mean they can respond the way you're expecting. You need to find out what... Um, what, what I was really saying is... Um, just trying to educate that even if you have off-duty police officers, they may not be able to respond in the way that you're expecting them to. So you need right. to actually find out what their response orders are. They may only be in a position where they can themselves call 911 to get a responder on scene. Right. I was in that same briefing yesterday, a great briefing, and, okay. and the scenario was there was an off-duty police officer that was working security, and the C-suite was under the understanding that if there was a workplace violence active assailant, this off-duty police officer would go straight in. Well, when the audit happened and they went up and they asked this off-duty police officer, hey, what's your role if there's an active assailant? Well, first I'm going to call 911. I'm going to call my buddies. They're going to come here and then we're going to go in together, which was completely different than what the CEO or the C-suite expectations were. That's, that, that's the, what you're talking about, right? So these are questions that we're not asking our guards. Because I can walk around, and, and I live here in Vegas and it scares the hell out of me because I can walk in any casino and talk to any security guard and ask them these questions, and they, they don't have answers. You know, I, just, I just tell people where to go. Yeah, bathroom's that way. Okay, what happens if? Oh, I don't know. Uh, okay. What are the security guard's rules of engagement? If they are allowed to engage, what is their rules of engagement? And do they have the proper training and equipment, such as uh, verifiable weapons training? Most of us, I'm sure, have a concealed carry for whatever state they belong to or whatever the case may be. How difficult is it to get that? 
How difficult is it to get an armed guard card? It's not, right? You shoot at three, five, and seven meters. Uh, you demonstrate that you can quasi handle the weapon safely, and you're good to go, right? Is that the person you really want engaging a target inside of a busy shopping mall? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, do they have uh, reten proper retention holders? If you can see this picture, this was floating around the internet for a bit. Um, anybody see what's wrong with the, the picture? The holster's upside down, right? Do they have less than lethal weapons, and are they trained and certified on it? Baton, right? Pepper spray, mace. And how do they deploy that? What's their rules of engagement on that, right? Uh, do they utilize handcuffs? If so, when, how? Do they have handcuffs training? Are they aware of what their detention policies are as far as taking in somebody into custody, holding them? Depends on what the environment it is, right? But do, have they been trained? Lastly, and it's bolded that I like, to, I like to highlight is, do they know their expectations? Do they know these rules of engagement? Do they know that, hey, if there's a workplace violence or active assailant situation, we're expecting you to do X, Y, and Z. Whether that X is escort people off property safely and in some sort of a controlled, manageable fashion, or you're the first responder, you're armed, go neutralize the threat or attempt to draw fire, right? I was gonna throw a picture in here, but I, I didn't really want to. So there was a mass shooting here and after the police body cam came out, we saw that on this one floor below, while the shooting was going on, there was multiple officers to include armed hotel security guards, plain clothes, suited up, cool guys with the lapel pins and they get to carry guns. And when the things got real, what did they do? Nothing, right? So it's important that they know their expectations. And to be honest, you can't make anybody go and charge that. You can, you can tell them that you are allowed to, you are empowered as an organization, we encourage you to do that, but you can't make them do it. But if they outright say, you know what, that's not my shtick, I'm not gonna go after that no matter what, maybe where they're positioned can change, right? If we know most attacks happen at the front entryway, maybe they're at the loading dock, right? Maybe they're watching something else that may not be as critical, right? So it's important, do they know their expectations? Now this has been floated around a lot, critical incident response teams. This has been floated around here in Vegas an awful lot. Uh, there is one facility here that does a, a, a great job on a critical incident response team that I'm aware of. There may be more, but I know one particular. But before an organization puts this into play, you have to understand it's a specialized niche within the security services, right? Again, that person that barely qualified to get an armed guard card, should they be on a critical response team? No, right? This requires a larger team to set up and operate. It takes a special skill set. Maybe former SWAT, maybe sp former military, right? I'm, I'm a little partial to the military, so I say military. But not all military. If you're handing out ID cards for the Army, does that make you qualified? No, it doesn't, right? What are some recruitment considerations? What's their background? How physically fit are they, right? They're going to take on a larger role, potentially larger responsibility. What's their overall ability? How can they, can they think on their feet? Can they problem solve? Can, can they lead? Uh, team management requires specific management skills as well. Again, those higher echelon of military, maybe SWAT commanders, things like that. Because they're gonna understand the specific and ongoing training that's gonna be required. Again, going out to the range and shooting a paper target at five meters is not gonna do it. These teams require shoot house training, knowing how to enter and clear rooms, uh, target discriminate, things like that. Which leads into specific SOPs. Everything from how they're dressed, to what weapons they carry, to how they move, how they shoot, move, and communicate, right? Those are in the SOPs. Why is it important to be focused on how they're dressed? Right, because you want to work with local law enforcement and you want law enforcement to recognize who they are. Is a lapel pin gonna be good enough? Probably not. If I'm a SWAT officer, if I'm a beat cop, beat cop better. If I'm a beat cop that has very little active shooter training, entry, uh, room entry training, and I go into a, a, a location that I know all the report, initial reports are wrong, all we know is there's shooting, there's killing going on, right? What am I looking for? Gun, threat. Am I looking for a lapel pin or am I looking for a gun? 
right? So those uniforms, that uniform should be distinctive, should stand out. All right, if you, there's a, there's a property on the strip, homework assignment if you wish, there's a property on a strip that has a uh, critical incident response team. They're very visible if you know what you're looking for. Go out and find them. I know they're there. So law enforcement inclusion is, is uh, critical. And now you need to talk about what's the potential additional liabilities now that I have a critical response team. Are they legally covered the same way that a police officer is if they shoot the wrong person? Nope. Right? So do you think your legal team is going to want to know about this? Do you think your insurance carrier is going to want to know about this? Absolutely. Because they're going to dictate and they're going to help guide you on your SOPs. Right? Does that all make sense? Medical equipment and training. This one I, I, uh, I actually hold close to my heart because, again, being involved or having been involved in five different mass casualty situations, uh, the conversation yesterday was was legitimate on the, on the uh, active shooter response. It's ugly, it's messy, and you don't have time. You know, per the, per the national standard from uh, the National Association of EMTs, they state it takes two to four minutes for somebody to bleed to death. Potentially bleed to death, right? I always tell people when I train them, you got it down to three, three minutes, because you weren't there when that initial hole got punctured, right? So you've got three minutes to potentially save your life or somebody else's life medically. How many med kits do organizations have these days? They've got the OSHA pre-approved band-aids and aspirins and tweezers, right? How many, show of hands in here, how many people have trauma kits in their, in their facility? Oh, great, awesome. But this is one of those things, if you think 10, 15 years ago, did we see AEDs everywhere? No. Right, everybody, organizations are like, oh man, I don't want AEDs, not in my place of business. That's a liability. Now what do we see? AEDs everywhere. It's the same thing with trauma kits. And those trauma kits don't be, have to be flashy and super high speed. They need to have tourniquets. I like to stick to the two major ones, SWAT or the CAT tourniquet. A pair of gloves, trauma bandage like an Israeli bandage, a roll of gauze, maybe some shears. It's not that expensive. It's not going to break the bank. The, kits that, the, the, the kit in the upper right-hand corner, just one individual kit, about 35, 40 bucks not that expensive compared to what a life is worth, right? And again, when we talk liability, when people die on your location, did you have medical kit? No. What if you would have had medical kit and they still died? Does that provide you some limited overhead coverage? Hey, we tried. We had this in place, right? So when you're being judged by your peers and that, that organization is being taken to court because they will be, what have you done to help mitigate the loss of life? Well, we have these med kits. We know that it's not a national standard. OSHA doesn't demand it to have us to have it, but we've got it. Okay, so you've gone above and beyond. That's a little bit of coverage. IFAC should be pre-staged and near IEDs is recommended. It, that's what's recommended. Make it a, make it a station, right? A life-saving station. Has anybody heard of bleedingcontrol.org or the class bleeding control? All right, it's a free class. There, there's no excuse or reason not to take this hour to two hour class. Here in Vegas, the UMC has this class and they put it on, I think, every other weekend or something like that, right? And it teaches basic life-saving, stop the bleed stuff, tourniquets, wound packing, and pressure bandages. Is that all that we need potentially to save someone's life? Absolutely, right? And again, these are, these are basic tools uh, that I recommend, sorry. Just trying to look at the time, make sure I don't go over too much. So to, uh, to bring it home for a second, this is the Boston bombing. How much time do you have to save somebody's life? Now these were gross amputations, lower extremity, femoral bleeds, femoral, a major femoral bleed, you're looking at that two minute mark. You're on that low end of that two minutes. So I'm not here to teach you guys first aid, but I'm here to bring it home that it's messy, it's ugly, and if you're not prepared and you haven't thought about it ahead of time, you're going to be setting yourself up to fail and potentially have loss of life at your organization. So when they talk about ROI, because we're all in expense, right? Security is an expense. We're an insurance policy. We're in case something happens. Well, things do happen. So again, that was just a short video to bring it home. 
Real quick legal summary. Reducing the occurrence, uh, by implementing specific programs, you can reduce the occurrence of workplace violence or minimize the effect of active assailants. If you plan for it, do you create yourself as a harder target? Yes, you do, right? So if, I'm a, if, you have, if you're a harder target and I'm looking and I'm doing my reconnaissance thinking about maybe your spot as an objective of mine and I see local law enforcement there, I see planning, I see this, that, and the other, what's my likelihood of success on the lower scale? I'm going to move on. I'm going to go some, find someplace else. Isn't that what the Aurora shooter did? Anybody familiar with that one? Okay, so he, he reconned a lot of different movie theaters, and he found this one was easy. I could prop the back door open. They have no guards there. I can get away with it. And that's what he did, versus other places that had a little bit higher security posture. It puts the organization in a much stronger position to defend against claims as well. Again, getting back to that medical. If you have these programs in place, when you go into court, because you will be sued, right? Everybody's in agreement on that you have a little bit more of a defense. Hey, we tried, we did this, but as I always like to say, you can't stop crazy. If it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. All we can do is prepare as much as we can. Uh, it can help lead to claims and causes of action being dismissed prior to, extensive, uh, prior to expensive discovery and trial phases. If you've got those training records of your security, you've got training records of all your personnel, they've been taught and not just told to see something, say something, but they understand that they have been taught situational awareness and not just told situational awareness, but explain what situational awareness is. It's time and space. Where am I now? Where am I going? Where have I been? And what influences are around me? If they've been taught that, does that reduce that liability? That, that, that defense team is going to be able to say, look, this is what we've done here. And they're going to be like, okay, yeah, well, we're still going to go after you, but instead of millions, maybe hundreds of thousands. In the worst case scenario, reduce the settlement costs as well. Same thing. So now we talked about legal. What kind of responsibilities do we have as an organization? So it, start, it starts at the top, right? Top management has to establish that workplace violence and uh, active assailant prevention is an organizational priority. Now, how do we do that as security directors? Well, we show them what the potential losses could be. Right? We, we show them in detail what those business impacts could be, right? Business continuity, uh, morale, performance, hiring, retention, all those different areas, right? So we get them to buy in. Once they buy in, they've got to give us a budget. There has to be a, a budget allocated. You may need hardware. You may need software. You may need third-party training companies to come in and either uh, train your people or come in audit what you currently have in place. They need to appoint appropriate personnel to develop and implement and monitor active assailant workplace violence prevention programs. They can't just go hire the, uh, the head of janitorial services to head this program up, right? No. Uh, they need to provide sufficient resources and authorizations. How many times have we been told, hey, work on this project, but every time you want to spend five bucks, you've got to go get approval on it, right? Does that slow down the entire process? Yes. Especially when we're talking active assailant workplace violence, it could happen today. So speed is of the essence. Finally, they need to review and approve workplace violence and active assailant prevention, all the policies. They need to get it across the desk and they need, to, they need to sign off on it. But if you've gone through the process properly, they've been in the loop on everything, so by the time that it's completed task, they're going to look at it and say, good job, and uh, it's short, simple, and sweet. So who should be on that program development team? Now, I've got a lot of people listed here, a lot of different groups that all should have some sort of play in it, but we're really going to talk and focus on the top three. So you've got to include human resources. As I go around the country and I teach uh, active assailant or I work with and do audits of organizations, everyone's so compartmentalized. Security department handles security department, HR handles HR, and legal gets involved only when legal needs to get involved, right? Well, we need to talk. We all have a piece in this, right? And that's why those are the top three. But if you also have occupational safety and health personnel, invite them into the conversation. Union leaders, that could be important because you may be asking their members to do something during that policy and procedure. You need to get right. You need to get a, a approval or, or blessing from the union leaders. Uh, any employee assistant uh, representatives. A lot of companies have uh, employee assistants within their organization. How does that play in an active shooter or workplace violence? Are they going to be key players after an incident is over? Absolutely, right. Uh, crisis management personnel, if you have any, risk management personnel, 
Public relations and corporate communications, they have a huge piece in this, right? Because how you handle an active assailant or workplace violence situation can ultimately, dis you know, that's what is going to be judged in the court of public opinion, right? So you need to have public relations involved into your planning process. So human resources, what are, the, what are their, some of their roles as it pertains to workplace violence and active assailant? They work with senior leadership to design and develop organizational safety objectives, right? They're looking at it from the 35,000 uh, foot level, what do we need to do to protect our employees? They manage the process and develop procedures to meet organizational objectives. They're the ones that kind of divide out the teams and make sure that everyone's accountable. They oversee all organizational policies, procedures, and crisis management plans. As a security department for larger organizations, yes, you have a director, yes, you have a vice president of security. However, generally, they also communicate with HR, and HR makes sure that their records and their processes are up to date. Uh, ensure organizational training and development is conducted, logged, and up to date. One thing I always like to say is if you conduct training and it's not logged, didn't happen, right? Because you can, if you need it in the court of uh, law, if you don't have a training record, did it, did it take place? Doesn't matter if it was last week. No, Mr. James Cameron, we don't, we don't have anything for you, right? Uh, works with all departments ensuring compliance and local, uh, uh, of local and federal law. Audits organization compliance with regulations and readiness. So that's kind of their shtick. That's what they do. Now, security departments, what do we do? Well, we work with the human resources in developing those procedures and to meet organizational objectives. This is critical. We have to work with HR. We assess the organization's general vulnerability to violence, right? We know those five categories of workplace violence, and we go ahead and we audit. We do that threat assessment and the vulnerability assessment, the risk assessment. We evaluate current prevention and intervention practices. What do we have in place right now? Do we have anything in place, right? When was the last time it was updated? We train the guard force internally or outsourced. So many organizations will hire a third party security company and then their hands off of it. Oh, they're going to do what they're supposed to do. We trust them, right? Should we trust them? Sure. But should we verify? Absolutely. And should we also give them guidance on what our expectations are of them? Not just at the highest level to that sales rep that you spoke to that said, yeah, we can feel 50 bodies 24 7 security at your location but actually talking to those site security uh, supervisors and to the agents themselves right does that make sense should you got to define the roles of arm, uh, armed and unarmed security officers do they simply observe and report we talked about this already can they intervene have you empowered them to intervene right so if you took a, a look at an armed uh, transport company transporting money. Most of the time they just say, hey, let it go, right? We can, the money's insured, we'll get it back, don't worry about it, let it go. But what if there's killing going on? What's their roles and responsibility? And do they know that they've changed or have they changed? Conduct SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Take a look at your organization, top to bottom. Everything from entry or uh, uh, access control to uh, personnel retention, termination process, hostile termination process, right? We also have to call, involve the legal counsel because they're the ones that are going to review the policies and procedures to make recommendations and limit organization liability exposure. How many times have we written something that looks great to us, we love this policy and procedure, and we give it to legal and they say, yeah, and they draw through half of the stuff that we recommend, right? Well, we got to find workarounds. We got to work with them as opposed to just looking at them as the bad guys, saying they, they don't let ever let us do nothing, right? So we need to work with them. <clears throat> they also have effective legal investigatory and fact-finding capabilities. Why is that important? Because they're going to look at case law. They can do the research on case law and say, you know what? The policy you are proposing won in this court case on this date, and no, no uh, liability was found. Or they're going to say, because you want to do that, let me show you case law where a company lost millions of dollars and was found guilty and negligent, right? Do we really do that? As security directors, we don't go that deep into it. That's why we have legal counsel. They identify potential legal risk and liability raised by courses of action the organization might consider. I'll give an example of that is termination. So 
if HR and security department come up with a process to terminate somebody, one write up, you're gone. Does legal counsel come in and say, mm, that's not really fair, we can't do that, right? Because now we're exposing to wrongful termination or whatever the un unintended consequences are of that policy. So they go ahead and help you out with that. And then of course they're there in legal defense if incidents occurs. So if they're involved with the entire circle of life of, this, of these programs, they're gonna know intimately what they've done to help mitigate that situation from occurring and then they can take those mitigation measures that they did and bring them into the court of law and say, this is what we did. This is how we try to prevent, right? Definitions, policies, that's the, who, the what and why and procedures, how, when, and who, right? So the policy is the guiding principle. What do we hope to achieve? The procedure or plan is how we're going to achieve it. I don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence with that one, but I'd like to throw it out there. So what are some of those policies, procedures, and plans that we need to be concerned with? Now keep in mind, anything too large, it will be completely disregarded, right? So these need to be simple and easy to follow, easy to implement, easy to gauge, easy to test, easy to replicate, right? Hiring process, what's the hiring process? Is security, security involved with the hiring process? Maybe, maybe not. What about background checks? Do we do, does the security department generally handle the background checks? Yeah, so we report back to HR and we make the recommendations based off of whatever matrix each individual company has or whether or not that person has passed that background check. Retention, that's an HR function, but again, uh, security can be involved. Termination, definitely we, sh we could be involved. Um, termination can have effect on access control. Who controls ID cards? Um, access to the building, is it security department or is it HR? Who turns off those accesses? Well, that's something for you guys to, to know. Uh, communications, this is during an event and also prior to an event. What's that communication like? Who's the chain of command? What's the chain of command? And you're gonna have a separate chain of command for crisis incident, right? Because the CEO may be the top of this chain of command in one level, but in a, in a crisis management situation, is that CEO in charge? Probably not, right? Reporting system, we always hear, see something, say something. Uh, what's the reporting system? What do they report? How do they report? Who do they report to? Is there feedback given? Once they submit something saying, hey, James Cam is creepy, okay, do we, does the organization investigate it and then report back? What kind of feedback are we giving back to that employee? And then again, what's that, what's that reporting system? And it can't be as simple as there's an open door policy. If I was in the military, Company commander, battalion commander always said there's an open door policy. Anybody ever use it? Absolutely not, right? Uh, key and access control talked about that. Lockdown procedures, what are your lockdown procedures? Do you have lockdown procedures? And in there, are you aware that, and I'm sure everybody else in this room is, but when I brief this, a lot of people don't know, during that lockdown, if you have electronic locks, what happens when you pull the fire alarm? It comes unlocked, right? Do your employees know that? No. Most at the lowest level don't know that. They think, oh, lockdown, door's locked, I'm good, right? So are they aware of it? It's catch 22 because you don't want to inform them of something and give them an, a tool that could potentially be used against them. Uh, so again, at what level you share information is at your discretion. Uh, <clears throat> training plans, again, what's being trained? Who's doing the training? Making sure that those people that are doing the training have a verifiable resume and have expertise in that area. Again, I don't want head of janitorial services coming in and telling me how to shoot. Even if I log it as James Cameron got shooting training today, well, who was the instructor? Isn't this guy head of janitorial services? You know, maybe he's an extra Delta guy that just wants to be a uh, janitorial. Cool, okay, different scenario. Uh, workplace violence templates, crisis management plans, again, not too detailed, but you have to cover a lot of bases in this. This is kind of fine, this is very detailed and should involve a lot of different moving parts. Not just within your organization, but it should also involve your paramedics, your fire, uh, your PD, right? Because they're gonna be the ones that are gonna assist you with making those plans on evacuation, triage sites, on location, things like that. Um, business continuity plan, how are you gonna get your business up, back up and running? If you've got an alternate work site, great. Where is it? Does everybody know about it? How does, who, who, uh, who presses that button and says, go to site B, 
right? And do you have the facilities at Site B to continue with those services and products that you're developing at the current site? Uh, recovery plans, post-incident. Post-incident is immediately after the site has been locked down by police, everyone's out, what are some considerations that we need to take as security directors, security managers? Post-incident, how about additional security for your location? It has now been opened, it's, a, it's no longer a crime scene, the police have turned it over to you. Do you have those creepy people that are looky-loos that wanna go check the site out? Yes. You know, is it locked down? Do we have additional security? That's post. Obviously, family care, things like that, but uh, facility-wise. You have short-term. Who's doing uh, uh, family care, survivor care? Uh, that's the short-term is also legal defense starts coming in. You start taking a look at after-actions reports. Mid-term, again, more legal stuff, family care. Long-term, what's, what's the plan for the anniversary? You know, anniversaries are important because it shows as an organization you care and you want to reflect back and you want to celebrate those survivors and you want to celebrate those that were lost, right? So keeping in mind, you got to have some sort of recovery plans. In essence, program development start to finish. You got to form a team, broad disciplined. Take a look in within your organization. Maybe at the lowest level working on a factory line, you've got some former army ranger that uh, he's, fill he's making widgets. Could he potentially be on this crisis management team? Yeah, maybe. He's got that leadership, potentially, right, if he wants the job or she. Understanding the situation. What's the world situation? I had a client that was making parts for DOD, very secretive. However, they had parts that showed up once an aircraft was shot down in Afghanistan, had their big company logo on it, company name on it, and all their facilities in the U.S. were vulnerable because they didn't have exterior access control. So they brought me in saying, oh my God, what do we do? Our name is out there now, right? So what's the world situation? What's your current policies and procedures? Do you have any? Are they old, are they outdated? Uh, what are your current programs? Uh, develop plans, workplace violence, crisis management, or emergency action plans, depending on which word you use. Business continuity plans, other policies and procedures. Review the plan and get approval, right? So if you develop it, it doesn't mean it can be implemented until it gets approved. And once it gets approved, you implement that plan. You train on it, and you exercise that plan. And while you're exercising it, you continue to maintain the plan. That's review, plan, adjust as needed, right? Maybe your plan was written, it was great. However, you just had a 10,000 square foot addition to your factory floor. Is your plan still current? No, right? Do we need to take a look at it? Maybe your access points have changed. Maybe your egress has changed. Your floor map definitely has, right? Organizational responsibility, everyone's got a, every department has got stake in this, right? Every department has a responsibility to provide a safe environment. Multi-department co uh, cooperation is critical for success. Human resources can't create this on their own. I work with a lot of human resource directors, and they say, oh, by the time we start getting into this, this is a lot bigger than we expected it to be. There's a lot more pieces. Well, yeah, okay. I don't tell you how to hire people. Don't tell me how to do security. I'll help you with that, right? But we work together. Um, members must include the highest and the lowest levels. When we get back to medical, talking about medical, could it be that janitor that is applying pressure to potentially save that wounded person? Absolutely. So why do we never train them? Right? We, we kind of leave them out. Why? Because we think that, oh, it's not going to happen to them or they're not going to help us? Of course they will. You never know where an active assailant or workplace violence situation is going to take place. We can look at the news and see that every day. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and all members have a responsibility to develop a plan. Remember, have a plan. Don't assume that it won't happen to your organization. You see this in every after action or every news report. What were you thinking? Oh, I never thought it would happen to me. Then all of a sudden, things, glass started breaking. Well, you, you had the wrong mindset. And organizations right now, we have, it's getting better, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Again, I'm a med guy. I go into places and I see no med kit. I do like to touch on uh, law enforcement and law enforcement training. So I, I work with organizations and they tell me, oh, our active assailant training, our local police come in and tell us. They train us. All right, so take, let's take a look at some positives and some negatives. 
Positive, develops a relationship with the organization. That's great, we want that. We want those police to come in. We want them walking our floor. We want them engaged. We want them to know how to make entry, things like that. Nothing wrong with that. They provide insight and recommendations from their point of view, right? Hey, we need a go bag. We need a, an emergency bag with uh, master access cards. Maybe you have radios, uh, a radio pre-charged on the, the master uh, frequency. Whatever, whatever their specific re recommendations and requirements are. They create a harder target because, again, if I'm looking and I see the police continuously coming in sporadically, maybe Wednesday, maybe Friday, am I going to want to attack that facility? Yeah, probably not. My chances of survivability are a lot lower. And it also reinsures employees. They get a good feeling, oh, cops are here all the time, right? It's good. What are some negatives, though? They only provide general information. They don't give any guidance on policies and procedures. Their policies and procedures run hide fight, right? They give little to no training on prevention. They don't talk about that pathway to violence. They don't talk about how to identify when a person may have issues. And when we talk about that pathway to violence, there's two ways we can approach uh, employees. If I'm coming in and I used to be a stellar salesman and now I'm coming in, I haven't shaved, I look disheveled, my clothes are dirty, I stink like booze. Is something going on with me? They're not teaching you how to, how to approach that. And as management, we can approach it two ways. James, straighten up. We don't tolerate that. You'll be fired next time, right? Or to identify this is potentially a problem. This person has a stressor. Something is going on in his life. Hey, James, what's going on? How can we help you today? How can the organization reach out to you and help you? What's going on, right? What would possibly de-escalate that? That second, that second approach, right? The, the police, don't, they're not going to talk to you about that during their training. When they do go in and they do these active assailant or active shooter trainings on site, what do they do? They'll come in and be like, okay, we're going to hand out wounded cards and your employees are going to get wounded cards. And, oh, I want you to lay here. I want you to lay here. And they lay there. They pretend they're wounded. But what is that employee actually getting out of that training? They're getting how to lay down on the ground. Who's getting the training? The police are. And the paramedics are, because they're, they're learning how to come into your facility. And that's great, but your employees aren't getting anything out of that. And they rely um, mostly on generic run, hide, fight videos, which are great. But again, there's a lot more detail that can be going into those videos. Organizations should include law enforcement and EMS, but not solely rely on them. Uh, real quick, training for all staff should include uh, what, what I call pace, prepare, action, care, and evacuate. So in preparation, what can we do to prepare employees, management at all levels ahead of time? So not just the planning, but uh, training on situational awareness, uh, reporting. And these don't have to be long, in-depth classes. These could be a 15-minute talk in a weekly meeting. Hey, today we're going to discuss, uh, we're going to discuss situational awareness and talk about that for 10 minutes, right? So these are things we can prepare ahead of time. Action, yes, that's run, hide, fight. What are the things that we need to consider when we're running, we're hiding, we're fighting? They're not in that order. A lot of, a lot of people at the lowest level think that's the order. Okay, I gotta run, then I gotta hide, and then I, I'm gonna have to fight. Well, it doesn't work that way, right? There's a lot of other, um, it's, it's very fluid, very dynamic. Care, again, I'm a medical guy, so what how and how can we potentially care for those wounded, knowing that they've only got two to four minutes to live if they're bleeding profusely, right? If they have an arterial bleed somewhere, how do we stop that? Pressure, pressure, pressure. We need to teach that. And evacuation considerations, you know, uh, sounds simple, but grilling it in, come running out, don't, don't come out with your hands in your pockets, cell phones, hands out, leave people behind, which is a tough thing to do. Um, leave your equipment behind. So the evacuation port. This is the training that should be for all staff. Remember, food for thought, fail to, pair, for, fail to prepare, you are prepared to fail. Smart guy, I think uh, Benjamin Franklin said that. So with that, I will take any questions. I think we got about five, 10 minutes. Yeah, we do. We have, yep. we have a good uh, 10, 15 minutes. If you have any questions, we'd like any interaction. Yep. If you would go to the microphone, if you have a question, please. Yeah, there's microphones on each side. If you have any questions, please come up. If not, then I appreciate your time. You in the back.
James. First, first, great presentation. Really, really well done. Thank you, sir. Um, Question for you. So we deal with this all the time in Boston. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we have is a 30-page questionnaire that we send out to employers when they're asking for these kinds of services for us because it's a liability for us just as it is for them. 100%. Uh, when you're trying to educate the client because, you know, there's obviously laws regarding uh, privacy, HIPAA and other things that the uh, privacy records for their uh, employees, uh, what, how do you, how do you uh, address that with, with employers that are looking for this service and are concerned about giving too much information, but yet we need that to be successful. Yeah, uh, w when it comes to situations like HIPAA and any kind of protective information, again, that's, that's where you have to work with that legal department and that HR and find out what exactly can you find out. Um, you're not going to necessarily find out about medical history of somebody or whether they're, they have a mental disorder, mental issue, but the workaround to that is what kind of disciplinary reports, is there any specific person that we need to be aware of? Based on disciplinary reports, track records, are they keeping those disciplinary reports? Because that can, without getting into HIPAA, that can also give a track record of somebody's kind of mindset and, and how they approach day-to-day -day work. Does that kind of answer? Uh, yes, uh, my question for you is uh, our company presently has unarmed security, and we're looking at possibly going to armed security, but. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, statistics on active assailant situations that have occurred in the United States? What percentage have occurred where there are armed guards in those facilities? And also anything uh, in particular that we really should be concerned with going to armed other than what you talked about here? Yeah, unfortunately, the, uh, the stopping of active assailants isn't as uh, newsworthy so that's not as prevalent in the news so there was there may be situations that happen I believe uh, the briefing yesterday had talked about a situation I hadn't heard of where a security guard actually put somebody down and you if you don't I don't have those numbers of what the success rate is I think that's what you're looking for as far as armed what's the success rate against a workplace violence or active assailant well actually if how many really occurred you know from what I just looked on my own see very few actually occur where there are armed guards yeah, but, I, but again, depending on what they consider an active shooter or attempted active shooter, because even the database that I look at has got thousands of shootings a year, and it's not just the Chicago, it's, it is still three or above that are killed in, in one location. There's thousands that happen a year, but only a very small percentage of that gets reported. So on the flip side of that, how, does, how do you find out which ones were actually successful or deterred? It's very difficult to, to prove that number. Okay. If that makes sense. Yes. All right. Thank you. Great. A question from our folks tuning in online. Uh, do you have any metrics that you use to establish a budget for the company's workplace violence program? That really is from location to location. So it depends on how many access points, how many employees they have, uh, how many facilities they have. Um, that all, all that information really goes into that risk assessment. And once you have that risk assessment, that's where you identify those vulnerabilities and then can be able to assess it's going to take X number of guards. And then also, depending on the client, you may need guards at a significantly higher trust level that may need security clearances for different facilities. So that's going to skew that number left or right, because if you're just doing a food packing facility, you may be all right with a $12 an hour guard. But then if you're doing a government contract site, they may require a 30 to $40 an hour guard. So it really depends. Each organization is, is very much different. But taking into account what their vulnerabilities are, access points, number of employees, number of locations, and the location, because something downtown LA is going to be a little bit different than, you know, in the middle of Montana. So, you know, location is also very diff different. Sir. I also think that the uh, presentation and the information is very relevant, very valuable, and uh, never enough can be said about training, especially to have it documented. My, my question is somewhat of a follow-up uh, to the unarmed security question in, in, in terms of stats. Uh, some of the information that I've seen suggests that 14% uh, of uh, active assailants, active shooters are um, thwarted. They're, they're, their efforts are, th are um, foiled by the civilians that are, are there. Do we have any st statistics that would demonstrate whether those civilians had received training or not? 
I, other than just the assumption that they've had basic training to be able to hold that position, there hasn't, I haven't seen anything in writing that states how much they have or have not had training. Uh, that, craft, that craft scenario where it was a full police force, or not police force, it was a full large company. They said they had the training and their employees just did not follow the training. So they had the documented training. It was just a negligent part of the security force to actually follow through which, with, with what they were supposed to do, even though it was there. So, so, so in, the, in the general, in the information that's given generally about uh, active shooters and 14% uh, being interrupted by civilians that were on the scene or, or that was actually a part of the uh, victim numbers, uh, do we know whether those were, were just uh, attentive civilians or uh, is there a separation between civilians that were there who had, who had, had previous training and followed some, some lead or, or just those who just acted out of, out of uh, response? So th the way I would approach that is even looking at the term active shooter and as I preferenced in the beginning, all these statistics, it really depends on how they're collecting their data and what their data points are defined as. So what DHS may say, this was an intervention of a shooting, the FBI may say, well, that was a security guard, that was his job, so it's not considered a outside intervention, per se. Whereas if it was uh, the, the Waffle House, where it was a civilian that said, I'm, if I'm gonna go out, he's gonna earn it, you know, that was an intervention, that was a pure civilian intervention, so was that, does that fall separate than a security guard that intervenes? And it really depends on who's collecting that data and how they're interpreting those data points. So I couldn't sit here and say, yeah, that's 100% right, because again, it, what agency is saying that? And then in this political climate, it also depends on what tilt are they? Because the NRA would probably say, oh, you know, 98% are stopped by, by handguns, whereas an anti-gun associate would be like, no, it's only 2%, so, you know, we, we need to ban all guns. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. 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 Yes, ma'am. Another question from our folks joining us online. Uh, can the workplace violence program be a part of the company's larger crisis management program? It should be. Yes, it absolutely should be. It, it should be. The, the workplace violence should be an appendix to a greater policy and procedure. So it should be its own either appendix or annex, uh, depending on what terminology you want. So it's not necessarily a standalone document because all these documents do intertwine together and they can reference one another. So absolutely, it should be part of that larger um, corporate, corporate planning. That it? Well, I appreciate your time, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of GSX. Don't forget. Thank you. If you have any questions, comments, or would like more information about our training programs, please give us a call at 866-724-7565 or send me an email at info at scg-lv.com. You can also visit our website at www.scg-pace.com.